And that is the end of me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you a question first and then we'll throw it out to the floor. I wanted to uh, do what I do best, which is speak as a peasant. Um, I'm playing Facebook chess, okay, and uh, I spend $50 and get a queen. Uh, everybody else I'm playing hasn't got the queen, they've got the other full chess, and everybody hasn't got the queen. The fairness of that, and I know you attributed this to the UK and the US, but it just seems simple to me. That, that kind of trashes the game, it stops the fairness of the I think it's really, really. going to affect the model of other people playing. I think it's really, really hard to apply virtual goods models to games which weren't designed with virtual goods models in mind from the beginning. Real Time Worlds. Dave Jones said uh, a game is doomed to fail if you consider the business model before you finish it. Uh, I would say completely the reverse. I would say this has been demonstrably proven in the last month or so. So chess has a set of rules for where virtual goods don't fit. Mm. Um, you, I don't think this works as retrofitting. I think you have to redesign how you're thinking about a game and make that fit. Um, I actually think that temporary power-ups are a big kind of part of it. Um, so to give you a simple example, uh, in a lot of the farming games, you can either come back every two hours to grow crops or you can pay some money to accelerate the growth to, to level up very quickly. If you were playing with, for the sake of argument, your school-aged daughter um, and you want to be at roughly the same level, she's got time to do that all of the time, you don't, so you spend some money so that you're at, at roughly level, level pegging. That might really piss her off, but you know, nevertheless, the option exists. You're feeling this, this, this time thing, aren't you? You're, you're not enjoying the fact that other people get more time gaming than you do, which, yeah. is, which is good. Any other questions for Nicholas? Very thoughtful question. Sure. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, Nicholas. That's great. Um, ben Lavery, Maverick Media here. <laughs> um, Radiohead released uh, a record where they let customers choose their own mm -hmm. price point, whether it was uh, zero pounds or infinite pounds. Can you know or can you hypothesize on whether or not they made more money than whether or not they set a price point for that track? I don't know the data. Um, I think that it slightly fails several of my kind of core elements. By choosing how much you're setting, I've already said that can, uh, humans aren't very good at knowing how much something is worth in abstract. They need rel a relative price points. If you give somebody a ten, a hundred, and a thousand dollar price point for that Radiohead album, then the true fans go, "Well, I'm a thousand dollar fan. I'll spend a thousand dollars." And the, "Oh, I don't really give a toss. I'll spend ten dollars, or more likely zero. Um, and it's something in between. When you let people have to think, uh, frictionless stuff, the less the, the less people have to think, the more likely you are to get the transaction to happen. My guess is that they did okay, but not brilliantly, because they've quietly dropped it and haven't done anything else. Um, it, I think it was a really interesting experiment. But it doesn't fit the power law perfectly, because with the power law, you have to offer people that sense of step-ups and status and emotions and feelings. I don't want to use the word. You have to manipulate your customers a little bit more into knowing where something is valuable. It's exclusive, 2,500 people, I must have it. And I could pay anything I want. I, I have, how much is an album worth to me if I really, really love it? An exclusive one, it's $300, so that's much worse, because that's how much I'm being asked to pay for it, and I'll either do it or not. So I don't think the choose-your-own-price model has kind of really worked. What I think it's really interesting for, for them, was raising publicity and awareness and distribution of their product and drawing new potential converts into their, their kind of band fan funnel. So I think that's really, it's valuable in that sense. I don't think we'll see that being repeated very often, to be honest. Any other questions? Anybody else want to ask? The man with the microphone. Yeah, just you, you, you talked about the manufacturer of scarcity, and I wonder if there are examples of games where there is an in-game auction to maybe allow these whales to say, I'm going to spend 10,000 on the frigate. Um, somebody experimented with that yet? So the scarcity is a very, very public way of, um, uh, of saying... Uh, it's such an obvious thing that I have to imagine there are, but I haven't seen any. I haven't seen anybody um, doing such a public sense. Um, I think one of the things, this is slightly back to Sean's point, is that people, hmm, depends on the territory. Russians, very, very big on ostentatious displays of wealth. Brits, not so much. US, obviously, somewhere in between, but actually nearer the Brits than the, than the Americans. So I've done some stuff and spent some money is fine. Admitting you spent $1,000 on Farmville stuff, I think it's not so obvious. So I think sometimes that stacy stuff needs to be a bit more subtle than simply the raw application of dollars. Um, Russian games seem to be benefiting from that one, that one most. 
Uh, in China, I'm hearing whispers that the government is saying this is all a bit unmeritocratic and we shouldn't allow people to get ahead on their, uh, on, because of their cash reserves. And there's a whole, there's a whole ideological problem that's, that's coming. Um, it's still $5 billion of the $15 billion online market. So I think that's really interesting. I think there are limits to how much people really want to admit they're spending. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people who can look at a Ferrari going past and know exactly how much it costs. Most gawkers don't. They just go, it's a Ferrari. And it's that kind of, it's that kind of balance. Anything else? Any words in the audience? Matt? Just a quick question about uh, the pricing scheme that you're, you're describing. There's an adage that says, uh, if, you, if you give it away for free, that's the implied value, that it's, it's essentially worthless if it's priced at zero. And the idea of 99 cents, or however they, pluck the, they figure out for Apple, really drives the creative process and levels the entire field so that uh, a Radiohead single is the same as you know, uh, what I might produce. And that creates a, a whole different issue and I'm wondering, one of, the, one of the things that I think zero value seems to imply is that you get a tremendous amount of gameplay when in fact having it priced at 99 cents or uh, a box price of 32 pounds in fact goes towards the marketing and promotion and getting above that great unwash. You know, and, and I guess I, I think there's a real implied problem with zero a free to play. It, it just makes it very difficult to establish a brand and get above the, the noise. I think that's partially, can I have the slides back for a second? Um, uh, I think that's partially true. Um, there is no doubt that if you were trying to build something as a product, notwithstanding my arguments with Sean, um, <coughs> as a product, um, then, you have a, um, then you have a problem with, uh, with the zero value because actually you're saying that some stuff which is paid $40, some which is zero, how does this, how does this kind of work? Um, what I view the marketing money you're talking about in a paid for thing um, doing is simply trying to lift people who are here on the price demand curve, this isn't the right one, but on the price demand curve, up to here. And you're spending money to artificially raise their preparedness, their perceived sense of the value. Personally, I think that's a waste of scarce capital. If you are Activision and you have more capital than you know what to do to it, it's a competitive advantage to do that because lots of other people can't. If you're an early stage developer, you can't spend that money up front. So you'd be better off going, I'm not going to artificially manipulate your sense of price demand by spending marketing money to change your mind. I'm going to come to as low as I possibly can. Then, to answer your next question about does that devalue it, it devalues it if you think what you're selling is content. And I no longer think that's what we're selling. We're selling experiences and emotions and feelings and status. And all of those are in, uh, insanely personal. There's not, an, uh, there's not an express point at which you, know, you might think that going to see Nine Inch Nails is a great experience, and I might think going to see Metallica is, and the two of us will never agree or whatever. Um, that it's so personal that we can now do that in that level. And the zero is the level playing field. The zero, the zero is, oh, this is a rubbish equivalent, is the equivalent of record labels giving everybody in the world a CD player so they can experience the music. Um, but then you charge the money for the music they actually want. Um, I mean, that's a rubbish analogy. But you, do, you get the thing what I'm doing, I, I'm saying, is that when you move away from thinking of it as products, which has an inherent value, think of it as a place in which you experience emotions and feelings and relationships and friendships and things and belonging, it's that that you're paying for. What you're paying for in the case of Nine Inch Nails is the statement of allegiance to Nine Inch Nails and that I am a Nine Inch Nails fan. The stuff that when you're at university, is there anybody in the room who didn't have a music band poster on the wall because it said something about their person? You didn't have a music band T-shirt or something like that. It's that stuff that you're selling, not the content. And my fundamental thesis is that we are not selling content anymore. Um, Do you this show, and then if there are any more, that would be... Then it'll be time for lunch. Indeed. And I have 10 copies of the book at the back if anybody wants them. Can we come to you? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's a good question. It's a good question. I've, I've priced it high as an experiment. My next one will be free. I felt rid when it was high, mate. Anyway, Alicia. Um, going back to your constant comments about time, the users that are in that game and playing that game with such time, they're actually investing in the game. That is a user Agreed. enhancement. And so it is, there is kind of a, a weird thing to think about there in... The money that is spent by people that don't invest the time, it's almost that they're earning their, their way in the game with that time investment. 
So how do you factor that kind of thinking into this model? I think, it's, I think you're absolutely right, and it's a game design problem. You have to find a way to make the users who are spending more time than money feel satisfied with that experience, and users spending more money than time to be satisfied with that experience. To be fair, Zynga and Playfish appear to have cracked it, because they have people who are spending huge amounts of time in those games and no money. And both Zynga and Playfish are totally fine with that. They bought into this kind of model. And there are other people, a proportion. I asked Christian to confirm the numbers. He said 90% sounds high. And that's, all, that's all I got from Christian about whether or not he, he saw the 80-20, uh, the 0.5%, the 90% rule that I, I had. Um, but he said that there are people who are very happy to exchange that. And the important thing for him, in some ways, is not making it too clear. There are some people who are levelling up a bit faster than other people because they've got more money than time, and other people are levelling up faster because they come back every two hours to harvest their crops, which somebody in an office can't do so, or, uh, or at work can't do so easily. Uh, what you've basically identified is not a fundamental problem with the model, but one of the biggest challenges facing game designers in this model. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. It's a really, really big problem. It can be solved because we've been proven, but it's a big problem. 